We've heard of the feminine genius, but is there a masculine genius? Is there such a thing as toxic masculinity? Do traditional gender roles trap us in unrealistic boxes? And what's the role of science in our search for truth? We'll answer these big questions and more on this episode with our guest, Catholic psychologist, Dr. Greg Bataro. Welcome, Dr. Greg. Thank you. Great to be here. Let's kind of just jump right in with, I think, one of the more interesting things that you sort of write and talk about, which is the masculine genius. Well, how do you define the masculine genius? Well, it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's a really important way to start talking about the masculine genius, how we define it. And, and, you know, I think that's, it's worth pausing on for a moment to just really unpack why, because it's, it becomes, uh, it's, it's almost, it's almost tempting to be really simplistic. Well, I would just say, is it complementarity? Well, it, it, it is involved with complementarity. And so what we have here are kinds of, of qualities of a person. But because our culture wants to be so quick to identify and define persons, we, we end up losing a lot when there's a lot more of a spectrum available to what is a person. So there's, there's something that has to be built in that is, that is uh, total and, and fully one or the other, male or female. But then there's also this idea that there are characteristics that can actually be held by both men and women. So this is the definition. It's the, it's the set of characteristics that men have primary access to because of their biology. Mm. And so okay. if, we, if we take that definition and unpack that, we could see that actually, so when we're talking about masculine genius things, qualities, characteristics, observations, they may be things that we see actually displayed by women. Mm -hmm. And this is where we get into trouble because you could say, well, the masculine genius is to provide. Well, doesn't a woman provide for her child when she's even nursing the baby at the breast? Right. And, or protection. I've heard, I've heard women say, well, you better believe that if there's a stranger at the door or some aggressor, of right. course, I'm going to be protecting my child. <laughs> the whole mama, the mama bear thing, the right? The whole mama yeah. bear thing. So it's like, why would we try to to limit our understanding of a genius of male or female to to these kinds of characteristics? So this is why we have to have both. We still have to say that there's something intrinsic to being a man that's different from being a woman. So when we talk about the masculine genius, and and of course depending on the audience who knows or doesn't know that this is connected to the feminine genius. And this is the work of John Paul II. And this is a really beautiful part of what our church now can try to unpack is that we, we, we want to talk more about characteristics and we can tie it in to say that, yes, in fact, the biology is different and biology gives men a certain leg up, a certain primary access to, qualities or characteristics that we could talk about as masculine genius. But that doesn't mean that we're then saying women will never have those qualities and vice versa. The feminine genius will be qualities and characteristics that, that women through their biology have access to, but men also learn and grow and develop the way that they can actually display those qualities as well. Okay. So what are the qualities that you believe men have a greater access to? Yeah, so this is where we can, again, we rely on the body. And, and this is what John Paul II tells us. The body makes visible the invisible. That's one of his catchphrases from the theology of the body. And so if you look at the brain and we look at the body of a man, we want to see where, what are the fundamental differences from the brain and body of a woman. Now, the way that the brain is set up is the communication within the brain is very different. So one of the basic differences is that men have what's called more compartmentalization. And so the brain has two hemispheres. There's a left hemisphere, the right hemisphere. And then there are all of these connections of communication channels that go across the two. And in women's brains, there's a lot more activity and connection happening between the two mm -hmm. hemispheres and between different areas of the brain. So for instance, women have a lot more connection between verbalization and feeling. And so that's why women have so many more words that they can use to describe their experience of something. Whereas men are typically much more limited in their vocabulary and their usage of words to describe an experience. So 
this is not a better or worse than this is simply a difference that we can say women are much more connected and men are much more compartmentalized and separated. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times for men, it's easier to separate oneself out from the emotion of a situation or the empathy of a situation. And men will have this access to sort of a kind of detachment, a separateness and otherness from the personal relationships that are involved in a certain situation. So at a very basic level of brain biology, we would say that's one characteristic that makes up the masculine genius that men have more access to because of their biology. Hmm. Okay. So you've discussed on your own podcast that there's a question of whether or not uh, there's a definition of being a person or being a man or being a woman, but that that isn't a question of science, but rather a question of philosophy. So how does that differ from what we've just discussed? Well, I, I think um, I think it's both. It wouldn't it wouldn't necessarily be one or the other. But the, the, the bigger question is, what is the role of science in our our search for truth? Mm -hmm. And when we say truth with a capital T, I think we need to understand that science can only give us direction and answers on things that are observable. But if we believe that there's a lot more to reality than what is only observable, then we could say that science itself is not equipped to give us the deepest answers about life in general. Right. So in general, we want to have a philosophical approach to understanding truth because philosophy gives us access to the things that are not observable, to those things that are spiritual or immaterial or just rational. So when we talk about what is anything, what is a person, what is, we're talking about the nature of things. And the nature of things is not observable. Mm -hmm. So this is where philosophy steps in, and then we use our, our faculties of intellect and reasoning, and even intuition, to try to get to places where we understand what thing really is. If we're talking about a man, what is a man? What is a woman? These are philosophical questions. And then we use science to help us get deeper and clearer in understanding them. It helps flesh out, literally fleshes out because we're talking about the observable, the way that we understand truth. So th there's a Catholic um, pediatric neurologist, Dr. Ricardo Luzando, who uh, who does presentations on this. And he he shows slides of a female fetal brain and a male fetal brain and points out the differences Mm -hmm. Even during even during human development inside the womb, between the male brain and the female brain, he said I could look at the brains of two newborns, you know, who say are having autopsies, and I could tell you instantaneously which is the male and which is the female brain because the brains are so differently structured. And I think we we know from a lot of the new brain science, right, that the male brain matures more slowly and doesn't completely mature until about the age of twenty five. And as you point out, there's a lot of differences in the verbal abilities of, of men and women. Um, so we start with the biology. And then as you point out, we go to the philosophy, but the biology informs the philosophy. So with it, is that sort of what you were getting at with your, with your comments? Yeah. I mean, I think, again, it, it depends on what we're aiming for. So if, if, you know, that's where John Paul II's quote, I find to be so helpful, the body makes visible the invisible. And so we could say whatever we believe to be true that's, again, capital T, truth, the invisible nature of things, we should see it, we should be able to connect it to what we're observing and flesh out what, what we're observing there in science. Um, and so it depends. If we're starting with the body, we can, we can start at the body and then move towards what's invisibly true about the person. Or philosophers start with the person and the ideas and the natures of things and then you know, leave it to other people. To, to maybe come up with the evidence to to correlate to it. Right. So so John Paul was so, I, I think, widely acclaimed and rightly so for this discussion of the feminist feminine genius and Mulieris Dignitatum and in, in his letter to women, he really championed this unique women's way of knowing, which of course, you know, as you've pointed out, begs the question about the masculine genius and what things, you know, men's way of knowing things or men men's way of doing this. But, you know, unfortunately it, it, it's just such a hostile culture, I think, to even conversations about these differences, particularly right now, um, that whenever you bring this up, the masculine genius, as opposed to the feminine genius, you immediately get pegged with questions about toxic ma masculinity. Sure. Can, can we speak? I mean, because that is such a buzz phrase right now. You, you know, you can't be on Twitter for more than 10 minutes without stumbling across it in one form or another. 
Can you talk a little bit about what you believe toxic toxic masculinity might be, and if if it is indeed a thing? Yeah, absolutely. I think. Uh, well, I think we have to have a really good, long, hard look and a, a humble and sobering look at at history, mm-hmm. and and really come to terms with and recognize the fact that that we as a culture, as a world, even even within the church have have implicitly or explicitly promoted a, 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 an inequality of the sexes and that there has been a an elevation of masculinity over femininity in history and we can look at the philosophy of saint thomas aquinas and we can find it there we can look in practical social norms within the church we can find it there and then we can obviously see it throughout culture and the secular culture. Mm-hmm. So I think that there is a natural, appropriate, and just reaction that should be looked at as far as a rebellion against the idea that that men are better than women. Hmm. And so, I, you know, I, that's where I like to start, because th- th- if, if we don't acknowledge that, then we're not going to really have... Uh, you know, any, any real, any, anything really important to say or, or, or trustworthy to say in the, in the cultural conversation. Now it's, it's obviously going far too far to then throw the baby out with the bathwater and then to erase masculinity as a good thing. And, and we, all it is, is a pendulum swinging too far to the other side where masculinity then becomes the bad thing. And so femininity becomes better than masculinity. And this is all that's going to keep happening unless we find a place to meet in the middle and say it's actually that they're equal, real equality. And real equality doesn't exist without real difference. Mm -hmm. And so if we're we're going to not acknowledge the differences, we're never going to get to a place of equality. So when men are being ambitious or when men put their own lives on the line to protect others. You know, every time we have the the anniversary of 9-11, you know, there are invariably stories about the men on flight 93 who banded together and said, no, you're not, you know, this this will not happen on our watch. And the women played a role. I, I believe one of the, the flight attendants who was a woman boiled some water and threw it on one of the, you know, uh, attackers so that the men could then physically overcome them. But, you know, we celebrate that as we should, as right. we should, right? But then- Um, yet by the same token, you know, men who are being, I think just naturally, I don't mean aggressive, but assertive in appropriate ways or ambitious are pilloried, um, you know, and by the very same voices that would have praised the men on, on 9-11. So how, how do you just as a psychologist, if you're, say you have a male patient, uh, who is trying to navigate his way as a young man in the workforce or what have you, how, how do you counsel him? to straddle those two worlds that unfortunately coexist right now? Well, we have to, you know, I, I really just help people work on themselves and within themselves, uh, you know, so the, the world of sort of a popular opinion or cultural movements and all of these things do, don't necessarily have to be the way that we work interiorly. But, you know, the way that I look at each person is we have to see the balance and the goodness of who God created us to be. And what we find natural within us, like, for instance, you mentioned, the, the delay of certain areas of a male brain uh, maturing. Now, we can take that too far and we could say, well, then, you know, men are just immature. And, you know, we look at a 20-year-old man versus a 20-year-old woman and we'd say, well, the woman is more mature. Well, actually, the part of the male's brain that is not as, quote unquote, mature as the woman's brain is directly connected to the part of the brain that's allowing him to make very risky decisions for instance, to use one's physical strength to overtake an attacker on a plane. Right. So do we want to call that an immaturity or do we want to call that a character strength? Mm. And the way we think about these things and talk about these things matters. But what we see here is that, okay, well, God made us for each other. So if we have only men left to what men have available to them, there's going to be something missing. If we had only women left with what women have available to them, there's going to be something missing. Mm-hmm. God made us to need each other. Right. That's what complementarity means. And so when we can see that there's good things within me, but there's also things that I need from the good things that are in women, if that's what I can work with a man to understand, then that's how we learn how to develop ourselves as persons 
more than just what we find in our biology, because the personal call is a call to communion. Right. Well, you know, it used to be, you know, many, well, I suppose just probably two generations ago that men and women tended to marry at much younger ages, you know, sometimes yes. 22, 23. And I, I know now that among some canonists in the church, some of the canon lawyers who work in marriage tribunals, that they're looking at the age of marriage as a potential for lack of due discretion, for example, as grounds for an annulment, you know, because mm. of, but yet we see far greater percentages of those marriages that did happen early, um, you know, say in the forties and fifties lasted for 50 or 60 years and mm. people who marry in their thirties divorce in less than 10 years. So do you think um, that there is any merit to, because again, this, you know, lack of maturation in, in both brains, but primarily the male brain before 25 sh does play a role in the ability to commit because that has, that is such a large issue now. Um, among, you know, anybody, any cultural commentator will talk about the importance of marriage um, in, in every ethnic community. People who are married are happier. They're better off financially. You know, they're more stable at their jobs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so are, is there a way to look at younger marriage in a positive light, despite the fact, again, you know, you just look at car insurance rates, right? It's much, much more expensive for a young man uh, to have car insurance when he's 23 uh, than when he's 27. How would you respond to that, those kind of conversations about lack of maturity, making it uh, difficult to make those kind of lifelong commitments? Yeah, I think I think it goes both ways. And, and we can see it really as a cross-cultural sort of societal issue right now where uh, it's it's across the board. People are I mean, it's like the, the last statistic I saw. It's the first time in history the 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 astounding percentage of 40 year olds that have never been married it's I know. something closer isn't it getting close to 30 percent now yeah. or something? and yeah. and uh it's just it's mind-blowing how how we're in this state right now but we've been watching this happen with the breakdown of the family and the breakdown of these this you know what 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 the church has called the cell of society right. the family is what makes up the community of society but the family is not being upheld as worthy of of protecting, mm -hmm. and so with contraception and then divorce and and uh, all the promiscuities that are allowed and the redefinition of marriage and the redefinition of gender and I mean we're just completely obliterating what it is to be human. So I think there's a lot of reasons that we can point at to see why and how marriage is in the state that it's in right now. I think it is absolutely a good for men and for women to that they, again, because of complementarity, they need each other. We need each other. And the sooner we move from the complementarity of the family that we grow up in, because we all start off with complementarity already with our parents and with the opposite sex parent. And then, but we, we then move from that complementarity into the further development of our complementarity in marriage. And so the sooner that that happens, the better. And and that's where, but ideas of commitment and submission to this institution and thing that's bigger than us comes with sacrifices and discipline and, and all of the things that are built in the family. So when mm -hmm. mom and dad are not actually sticking it out for each other, or, you know, they're not actually giving a model of what love and respect and, and real service of the other looks like, then you can't expect the kids are learning it anywhere. Right. Well, should we support traditional gender roles then, or does that just force people into boxes? I think we need to understand the true capacity of a man and the true capacity of a woman, and then it fits into cultural context. So when you say support traditional gender roles, that's a very loaded term, mm -hmm. and it's a loaded idea. So I, I think we want to be able to support to the extent that it fits within the true nature of who we really are. Right. And so so it's not that the true nature of a woman is that a woman can't go to work. That's not appropriately understanding the context and the true nature of the woman. Sure. However, if we understand that it is part of the true nature of a woman to to give birth to a child and 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 nurse a child and is that and that primary physical connection to that child, then we say supporting supporting that traditional quote unquote role, does that mean allowing for the workplace to have different criteria, different allowances, different policies to support 
that reality? Absolutely. That should definitely be happening. Okay. Um, well, let's just talk, uh, I'm going to shift gears a little bit here because you have such an interesting personal story. Um, so you've discerned with the Franciscan friars of the renewal. Do That's I have correct. that correct? Yep. So the, uh, so father, the, the order that Benedict Rochelle helped yep. found, um, but now you're married with children and a very successful career in psychology. Um, let, let's talk a little bit about your own personal journey. Sure. Was father sure. Rochelle an inspiration to you in, in the psychological sciences? Yes, absolutely. So, uh, you know, when I was 17, uh, I was senior in, in high school, my parents got divorced and then I went to college. I got into, uh, started my first year at Boston College and and by God's grace, I ended up in a classroom with Peter Kreeft. Oh, wow. And, okay. and so uh, Dr. Peter Kreeft was teaching me philosophy, taught me how to think. Right. And I was making sense of the pain I was feeling and then, uh, you know, read Love and Responsibility from Pope John Paul II. And, and it really kind of shown this, this, this deep light in everything that I was experiencing. And I saw love and responsibility as the answer to the pain I was feeling. And also I, what I saw as the, the mess that our culture was headed towards. And, and so that was the year 2000. And, uh, so then I started discerning a religious vocation. I ended up transferring to Franciscan university. I met the CFR friars. I met father Benedict. I met a, a number of the other founders and some of the early brothers there. And, um, and so I was, I was really kind of, I was dating a little bit. I was exploring, I was getting to know myself. I was becoming an adult. Uh, by the time I graduated, I, I was still feeling called to the, to the friars. So, so I went to the Bronx, I joined the CFRs. I was there for almost four years. Wow. And so I went through temporary vows and, and, um, before making final vows, I had done so much of my own personal work and growth that I realized that a big part of my own sense of what I wanted was coming from wounds and specifically the wounds of my parents' divorce. And so working with Father Benedict helped me heal those wounds and and it was able to then rediscover an even deeper vocation within my heart, which was to marriage. So I ended up leaving the friars, went back to school, got my doctorate in psychology. Um, my last year in DC there in the program I was in, I met my wife. And so um, I moved to New York, we got married and uh, started our family. And so, yeah, we have seven kids now, and uh, we've got um, an awesome, uh, awesome practice and, and flourishing career and in, in integration of Catholic faith and, and philosophy with psychology. So it's been a real blessed journey. Yeah, well, it's it's a it's a beautiful story, and I so I know you're the you're the executive director at the Catholic Psych Institute, and uh, listeners will link to that in the show notes below. Um, can we just talk a little bit about how? Um, within the the field of mental health, your particular approach would be different from, say, a a secular practice? Yeah. So practically what we're doing now is very different. Um, We we kind of realized that, uh, you know, there's a place for secular traditional psychotherapy. There's a place for the medical model. There's a place for diagnosis. There's a place for all those things. However, what we end up doing is, is walking with people uh, in a much more personal, deeper way. And I really took a, stu- a step back at one point and, and deep discernment. I kind of hit a wall of frustration at one point, really, really trying to make this vocational and wanting to help people the way that I felt Christ was calling me to. And the, it seemed like the secular model was limited. Right. And I really kind of took a deep dive into into a little bit of an inner cave and and spent some time in in sitting with that, and and felt called to maybe look at a different way to do it. And so, what I thought about was how Christ encounters us on a daily basis and and wants to be a part of our normal life. Okay. And so if I'm going to do His work and be His hands and feet and mouth and ears, then I have to be present with people the way that He wants to be present with us. So we sort of redeveloped a different model and we actually work with people on a daily basis. And you Catholics and non-Catholics. Yeah, we can work with non-Catholics. It's mm-hmm. it's you know, our model, the way we look at it is is we have the blueprint for the human person. Right. We know how God made us. Right. So uh, that comes because through our Catholic faith, but we could use that blueprint for anybody as long as you're human. We know how you're made. Now, you might be right. on a much different step of the journey than somebody who 
is you know fully embraced in the in the faith and and knows who god is and knows who they are in that light but but we know who people are so that means that we can work with anybody okay so well let's just go back to this um this catholic approach which of course is faith and science together right and you've just done some really interesting we we've touched upon this a little bit at the beginning but i want to circle back a little bit to the to the brain science and the difference between men and women in terms of the actual scientific data about that. Can you just, what, what are a couple of things that our listeners might not know in that particular area that you could share with us that would shed some light on why women act the way they do and men act the way that they do? <laughs> I know that's a very kind of touchy topic, but you know, we used to be able to like, there used to be like sitcoms about this kind of oh, stuff. Oh gosh, I love this topic. You, you, can't, you can't even broach it now, it seems. I know that's a broad question, but just like some kind of science fun facts about male and female brains. No, I love it. I think, you know, so here's here's one thing that I think is really interesting. We we get into these discussions and use the, the the stereotype is that if a if a man and a woman are working through a conflict, that a man's approach is that he just wants to fix the problem. Right. And the woman's approach is that she wants to talk and she wants her feelings to be heard and and so, you know, she could be bringing up a situation with her friends or something's going on when, and, and the husband is, or the, the man is listening. And then he's like, all right, well, this is what I would do in that situation. Mm -hmm. You know? And then she, you know, her response is like, well, you're not listening to the whole. Right. Right. So, right. Right. You know, I didn't even finish yet. You know, and he's like, but the, the answer is clear. Like I can see this right away. Right. There's an old YouTube video that, um, the, the, the girl sitting on the couch and she's saying, you know, I have this pain in my head. And, you know, it's just emanating from this spot and it's just, I can feel it. And then the man's looking at her with this bewildered look on his face. And as the camera angle pans around, you can see that she has a nail sticking out of her forehead. <laughs> Have you seen this video? Yes, I, I know the one you're referencing. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very it's funny. Like, I think it's called, it's not about the nail or something. It's it's not the nail if you want to look, look it up. But, and so he's like, but if you just take the nail out of your head, and she's like, it's not about the nail. Right. <laughs> She's like, you're not listening to me. You know, so again, I think with sensitivity, I think it's always important to notice what's happening here. There's there's two angles that could be taken. And in that video, I think it's it's putting the feminine genius into a bad light. It's, right. it's poking fun at the way that women typically communicate. And in most of the time, I would say in sitcoms and comedy and, and things, we're usually poking fun at the way the man handles the situation. And it's like, men are just dumb cavemen and they don't really know how to relate. Well, they... right, right. Do you remember, do you remember that whole thing defending the caveman? I mean, that was like, Oh the, yeah. Uh, the, um, it was on Broadway. It was, I went to see it with my husband. It was wildly popular. That guy could not get on a stage anywhere in this country now and, and do the same jokes. He couldn't, they, he'd be shot or somebody, you know, yes. I, 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 and everybody loved it. I mean, it was a, it was a success for a reason. Yes. And so, yeah, it taps into this thing that's so deeply resonating and true with us. So, but what ends up happening is that we see that there are two different systems in the brain and we all have ways that we feel anxiety and we all have ways that we resolve that anxiety. And I use that word anxiety in a really general way. So I'm not talking about a, you know, an anxiety disorder, but we all have ways that our system overall gets sort of ramped up to generalize it. And then ways that we calm down. Okay. And the way that a woman's brain gets ramped up, she will she will find she will perceive a problem, and her brain is actually picking out interpersonal problems more quickly, uh, or or she feels them more deeply in a, in a certain sense, and it gets it gets amplified. And then the way that a woman's brain is going to feel resolution is through interpersonal connection. And so empathy becomes a channel for reducing anxiety in the so woman's So there's like brain. a chemical response in her brain. There's a chemical response in her okay. brain. And there's all sorts of like, there's mirror neurons that, that there, there are parts of the brain that can see the way another person is seeing and then feels the way that another person is feeling. Mm -hmm. And it connects the dots between what's observed and what's experienced. And then that becomes an internal experience. So when you have two people that are sort of like tracking on the same page with each other in, in a, especially in a woman's brain, it's going to release certain chemicals that actually reduce that initial uh, spark of, okay. of, of anxiety. Okay. In a man's brain, we start with the same trigger. So we will see 
that there's some kind of rupture or difficulty or problem. And in fact, studies show that the man's brain sees it even faster. Hmm. We will pick up on an interpersonal difficulty as a man, as a man's brain, even faster. I wouldn't have guessed that. I wouldn't have guessed that. No, because this is what happens. A man's brain doesn't find a reduction in anxiety through connection, through interpersonal connection or empathy. A man's brain, as soon as we have that triggered sense of there's a problem in this other person, it immediately, as quickly as it takes another woman to feel the problem in the first place, in the man's brain, it's triggering a secondary system. And the secondary system goes into problem-solving mode. And not until the problem-solving mode has a resolution does the man's anxiety become reduced. Okay, so, so this is interesting because this is a piece of advice that was given to me as a married woman, uh, was that if I was in conflict with my spouse and we couldn't get past whatever issue, you know, when we were, whatever, not speaking to each other, ask him to do something to help me. Ask him to fix something for me. Yes. And oh, yeah. Would, yeah. And that would start. And I thought that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. But I thought, okay, couldn't hurt to try it. So I did. And sure enough, it does. It For whatever reason, it, it worked. That's kind of like a side circumventing sort of like hack. You can use mm -hmm. that trick. You're like hacking the man's brain. And get something done at the same time. And, and you get something <laughs> done at the same time. You finally get that shelf put up or whatever it was. <laughs> But you, you know, it, because you're then activating a part of the brain and it, for the man, it might feel completely unrelated and totally separated. And for a woman who knows why she's doing it, it's to restore some interpersonal connection. It's probably in her brain, like still serving the same purpose, but he does it. It's almost like the man's brain is so compartmentalized. He, he doesn't even have to realize that that's what's happening. But here's, here's the trick. You can actually directly use this information in the midst of the conflict if you understand the difference. So what, what happens is this, and this is what I tell women. Men can perceive problems all over the place. We can see a problem in every other person around us. We see people walking down the street, at the park, at the store, at the, you know, wherever. And it's like, we can see people in other cars on the road. We see everybody's problems all around us. Mm -hmm. We just don't care that much. Okay. You see, but, but so a man is not going into problem solving mode with every person that he sees all around them. It's when he sees a problem in a person whom he, he values in a relationship that he values that it triggers his problem solving mode. So the very first thing for a woman to understand is, okay, if he's trying to quote unquote, fix my problem or fix the problem, it's because he actually cares about me. Right. So at the very least start there. Second, then the next thing I do is tell the man, okay, your brains are built differently. The, the number one problem that your wife or your girlfriend or the woman that you're, you're talking to is feeling is that there's a, a, a rupture, a disconnect in the relationship. So if you want to fix the problem, here's how to do it. Step one, look at her in the eyes. Step two, listen to the words that she's saying. <laughs> Step three, repeat the words that she's <laughs> saying and say them back to her. And then, so you make it into a manual. It's like right. a step-by-step -step manual of how to fix a problem. And now he goes, but that's not even the problem. And he goes, but that is the, then, then I say that is the problem. And so maybe it's about the girlfriend who's talking behind her back and this other situation happened at work and some da, da, da. Okay, fine. That's a secondary problem. The primary problem is the disconnect she feels with you and you can be present to her. And then once you've rebuilt that bridge, then you can use your problem solving skills on that secondary problem. And she's going to be even more open to what you have to say about it. Okay. So if we, if we get into the nitty gritty of this, we could say that should we be uh, sort of putting down one approach or the other? No. And, and that's the woundedness of our culture that we joke about these things in derogatory ways. Instead, we have to heal the rift that happened in the garden between Adam and Eve. And we have to come to cherish the otherness of the other, not hiding from each other behind fig leaves, but revealing the beauty and goodness and fullness of ourselves, of each of us and our differences to each other. And then in a trust and mutual respect, 
and mutual trust, we can actually help each other, become helpmates that God wanted us to be for each other. Right. Well, how just as we're kind of wrapping up here, I know it's it's a much more acceptable thing now to go to therapy um, or to seek that kind of help if you're having depression or anxiety. Mental health is, has really become almost in a crisis mode from what I understand be, yeah. af- since after COVID really did a number on you know people psychologically. So how how would you recommend if our listeners here are they've never done therapy before they're trying to figure out whether or not they want to do that um how do you how do you recommend they discern whether or not they actually need therapy or they're just maybe going through a season of something in their life and then secondly if they're not near someone like you how do they find a therapist who reflects their values and won't try and you know um force them into some kind of mindset that is and anti- antithetical to their Catholic faith. It's really important. We we have set up free consultations now. So we, you know, people can come to catholicpsych.com. You go to catholicpsych.com slash contact and make an appointment. We have free 15 minute consultations and we have a network. Um, we will direct people if we think that they need traditional psychotherapy. We have a network of good Catholic psychotherapy. We provide what we call mentorship, which is a little different. It's available to anybody anywhere. You don't have to be in the same state, even in the same country. And so we do have that available. If that seems like that's a good fit, we'll, we'll help people figure it out. Sometimes, you know, we have courses available. We have books. Sometimes you, you don't need to go all in with some of some of these other measures, Okay. Uh, depending on what people are going through. So we're going to help people kind of work through that and figure out what's what's right for them. Oh, that's, that's a terrific, that's a terrific service to offer because, you know, a therapy can be very expensive and often insurance doesn't cover it. And so to help someone figure out whether or not this is something they need. And if so, then, then where to go. That's, that's a terrific thing. Well, you're, you have your, uh, your podcast titled being human. Um, and we will have a link to that in our show notes, listeners below. Um, just as we're wrapping up and, and closing out our wonderful conversation here, how do you recommend that people, uh, you know, sort of dive into your website and then sort of grapple with that question of what it means to be a human being. Well, the podcast, I would say, is a great place to start. And and we've unpacked a lot of different content and episodes there. Our, our, our podcast page is actually really cool with the technology that's available now. You can actually search keywords. They've all the different episodes are transcribed internally on the back end of this website. And so if you go to catholicpsych.com slash podcast, You can put in a topic, a search term, and then it'll tell you all the episodes where a particular term has come up. So if you're thinking about depression or narcissism or personality disorder or something with kids or whatever the case might be, and all the different episodes where we've touched on those topics will pop up for you. Thank you so much for joining us on the Edify podcast. Thank you. Thank you for listening. To make it easier for you to listen to future Edify podcast episodes, please make sure you subscribe over at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Thank you.